Greetings. Uh, we're very pleased to have you join us today. My name is Janie Hip. I'm a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation. I uh, serve as the general counsel for USDA and hello to all of my friends in Indian Country. Um, I'm going to be moderating the Economic and Workforce Development Panel today, and we're very pleased that you've joined us, along with some esteemed guests with us. Um, and I first am going to very quickly introduce our panel members so we can get right into our discussion. Our first panelist from the administration is Secretary Marty Walsh. I've heard that it's okay to call you Marty Walsh, Secretary, and it's really wonderful to have you here. He's the Secretary of the Department of Labor, serving as the first union leader in 40 years to run that department. He previously served as the 54th mayor of Boston, followed his father into the local 223 in Boston, and went on to head the Building and Construction Trades Council um, and uh, thereafter worked as a legislator um, while earning his degree. And I hear that he is a lifelong advocate of prevention and treatment of addiction, to which I'm very um, akin to that, and I really appreciate your work in that space. We also have with us uh, Administrator Isabel Guzman from the Small Business Administration. We're very pleased to have her with us today. She serves as the 27th Administrator of SBA, and she represents more than 30 million uh, U.S. small businesses and is a lifelong proponent of small businesses. She previously served at, uh, at SBA in, as the agency's Deputy Chief of Staff and senior advisor during the Obama-Biden administration. She's been a small business entrepreneur herself, which we share that experience. <laughs> and uh, she is very much uh, aligned with our small businesses around the country and accelerating um, their capacities and helping them make uh, connections into leveraging the federal marketplace. So we're thankful that she's with us today. We also have with us senior advisor, Jean Sperling. Jean Sperling is uh, senior advisor to the president, and he also is the American Rescue Plan coordinator. So we thank Jean for his work in that space. He previously served as the director of the National Economic Council and assistant to the president for economic policy under presidents Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. And we are very happy he's back in service again with President Obama, uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris. So thank you, Gene, for joining us today. And our tribal leader participants, it's really good to see you all today. Um, on the screen, we have Chairman W. Ron Allen uh, from Janestown Sklalem. And he is such a good friend. It's good to see him here today. He was appointed to the Tribal Council in 1975. He served as chair since 1977 and chief executive officer since 1982. He has served in so many capacities, um, really is a true uh, pre prevalent leader in Indian country, four years as president of the National Congress of American Indians, and a total of 26 years as an officer of that organization since 1989. He is currently serving in various capacities, including being uh, on ad advisory councils to the U.S. Department of Interior, Health and Human Services, Department of Justice, and the Department of Treasury Internal Revenue Service. And finally, we have Chairman Mark Macaro from the Pechanga Band of Lisueno Indians. He, is, uh, he was first elected to the Tribal Council in 1992. He was recently elected to the NCII Executive Board as first vice president in, in 2021, and he has served as tribal chairman of his tribe since 1995, with 2021 marking his 26th consecutive year as tribal chairman, which is quite an accomplishment. So we're very happy that you all are all with us today. Our focus today is on economic development and workforce development, which are deeply intertwined issues. And I'm just gonna move straight into the questions uh, and dispense with any other conversation on my part. Um, I'm going to move first to the questions that I have before us. We've shared those with you all. And uh, when we deal with the first question, I'd like for Chairman Allen to uh, speak first uh, in response to the question, uh, followed by Chairman Macaro, then Secretary Walsh, um, Administrator Guzman, and then Senior Advisor Sperling in that order. So the first question is this. 
What should the Biden-Harris administration be doing to promote and support economic development in Indian country? So Chairman Allen, let's start with you. Well, thank you, Janie. Um, and thank you for the uh, honor of being invited onto this panel and uh, a participant in this annual summit with the uh, Biden-Harris administration. A shout out to them uh, that they uh, resumed this after our last four year hi hiatus um, and uh, pick picking up where uh, President Obama and Vice President Biden uh, left off uh, four years ago. Um, and I do want to give a shout out to Libby and, and Pawi and Morgan uh, 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 Rodman um, for their efforts too and, and coordinating all of us uh, to participate. Uh, this has been a great uh, participation for these last two days. Um, a lot of issues being raised by us. Nothing more important than uh, economic development. I, I would uh, begin this conversation by uh, pointing out that over the last uh, 10 plus years, tribes have worked very closely with OMB uh, trying to identify uh, how, how many, uh, how much resources have the administration been providing the tribes in order to advance our agenda for, for uh, self-governance and, and economic development, uh, taking care of our people, et cetera. The most recent report by OMB in, in their cross-cut report basically says it's about 28 billion, 29 billion, somewhere in that range. When I believe, and I think my colleagues believe firmly, that the, the true need of our 574 Indian nations from Alaska to Florida um, it probably is north of 250 or 300 billion annual. So that tells you we've got a range to go uh, to, to fulfill the, the true needs of our communities from all the different programs that we have discussed, from natural resources, healthcare, education, public safety, and on down the line. So the question is, how do we get there? So I, I, bottom line is everybody's well aware of, of the huge uh, deficit that the America is uh, has accumulated over the years uh, to the tune of uh, tens and twenties of trillions. So is the federal government ever going to come up with the resources that'll meet that 250, 300 trillion? The answer is no, it just, it just can't get there. Um, and so the question is, how do we do, how do we get there? So my argument is that, that how we get there is self-reliance. Um, it's an agenda that I know uh, Chairman McCarl advanced back out there in California uh, years ago in, in the gaming uh, implementation of the Gaming Regulatory Act. Um, and I'm a big believer in it. It means that as we try to move our federal government, uh, excuse me, our tribal government forward to be more self-reliant uh, and not dependent on the federal government, not that we would ever release the federal government from its treaty and statutory and moral obligations to Indian country, but in order to, to fulfill that gap, it is going to be our economic arm. And quite frankly, I, you know, the the, um, the um, American Rescue Plan, the, the CARES money that came out of the last administration, um, and the, uh, the new the infrastructure plan, they are all going to help make a difference. Um, and they, but they're just authorized. And so now the question of the day, and it's relative to some of the previous comments on the previous panels, is how to get the money to the tribes, how to assure that you're going to provide us the greatest flexibility, and how you're going to be able to uh, uh, collaborate with the tribes relative to the unique needs of each tribe. Now, when you think of the 574 Indian nations, we're, co we're complicated. We're large and we're small, large land base, small land base, large numbers of tribal citizens, small numbers of tribal citizens, different levels of sophistication. So quite frankly, the administration needs to step up to assist the tribes for those who need more assistance in elevating their political legal infrastructure so that they can go out and secure the resources that they need or utilize the existing resources the administration is, being, is providing us to allow us to be able to move our economic arm forward. Each of us will come up with what works for us, what business, what, en what enterprise will work for us. Most of us are trying to diversify our economic portfolio. That is critically important. Uh, most of us are in rural communities for the most part. And so now we're trying to figure out how to recruit and retain professionals and talent in order for our business to be success. So I'll stop with my opening remarks there, Janie. I, there's, there's a lot to um, this subject matter as we peel back this onion, um, but uh, um, I, I look forward to engaging in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman McCarrow, we'll turn to you. 
Okay, good morning. May you yum. Hello, I'm a guy. I love a cup of out when I live out of mesh. No tongue, you can't mark my car. Pichang, I am Kutoshnakat. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be here with all of you. Uh, my name is Mark McCarl. I'm the tribal chairman for the Pechanga people for Pechanga Indian Reservation. Um, thank you for the opportunity. You, we certainly appreciate that the uh, administration uh, and, and the Biden administration in particular chose to move forward with this, with all the other things that are going on right now, uh, rather than to deferring it till next year. It's absolutely important to hear from Indian country on all the topics that are being addressed. So in reference to the first question, Tribal nations are building strong economies and investing in their communities by supporting the development of native-owned businesses, providing tools and resources to their citizens, uh, and, and, and to their citizens' need to pursue economic opportunities. Uh, you know, there are still barriers that 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 are, that are out there right now that uh, are, are are necessary to be overcome, and so um, I think that. Uh, as a result of engagement and in, in, in consultation with Indian country, we can overcome these things. Interagency cooperation, regulatory changes that incorporate tribal priorities and increase access to capital are all ways that things can be, uh, these changes can be uh, accomplished. Um, I think as a baseline, the administration should continue to ensure that any initiatives to support economic development in Indian country are a result of engagement and consultation with Indian country. Interagency cooperation, regulatory changes that incorporate tribal priorities, and increased access to capital are, are continuing ways to be accomplished. So while many of our policy priorities are familiar, let me say that the pandemic has placed our tribal governments and enterprises on shifting sands, forcing all of us to be nimble and flexible as we find new paths forward to support and protect our communities. So, while well, Indian country, well, Indian country has found some success in building our economies, there are key actions that can be taken to foster our efforts and remove remaining impediments. So first, we're hopeful that the administration will continue to support the modernization of tribal governmental bond issuances that, on a par with state and local governments, facilitate tribal infrastructure development and financing of tribal projects. You've heard much about the need to both fund and incentivize the development in Indian countries to telecommunications infrastructure, particularly access to broadband. This infrastructure is critical as we seek new opportunities in the changing economy and modernize our access to healthcare and education. Critically, all of these priorities and others outside of Indian country will involve permitting processes. These processes must include tribal nations in the planning from the outset in order to ensure our tribal lands and cultural sites are respected and protected. Beyond infrastructure, it remains a priority for tribal governments to amend the NLRA to restore governmental parity and uphold the inherent rights of tribes to self-governance by providing the same ability as all other governments to regulate labor relations for our employees. I also recommend the administration refocus efforts on approving revised Indian trader regulations, which will allow tribes to keep tax revenues generated on the reservation. We also look forward to partnering with you to address dual taxation in Indian country. State taxation of business activities occurring within Indian country is a threat to tribal self-sufficiency and the federal government should completely preempt the field of regulation of such activities. State taxation of economic activities in Indian country reduces tribal business on tribal lands and suppresses economic activity that would otherwise benefit tribal nations and surrounding communities. It's also critical that tribal government access, that tribal governmental access to capital and credit be increased and streamlined. One example of this is to allocate greater percentages of USDA rural development, DOE, SBA and CDFI funding to Indian country. Another is to make permanent the waiver for the non-federal match requirement for the CDFI funds, Native American CDFI assistance program. I can provide you with additional examples, but I want to be cognizant of my time. Thank so you. I think at this point, I'll go ahead and yield that right now. Thank you, Chairman. Secretary Walsh, what is, uh, do you have some thoughts to share with us today? Yeah, th thank you, Janie. And I want to thank uh, my panelists, uh, Jim and Alan, uh, Jim and Macaro, 
uh, Administrator Guzman, um, my friend Gene Sperling, thank you very much. This is a, a great panel to be on. I want to thank all the tribal leaders who are present today. Uh, I had a chance to listen to uh, the last session, and I just want you to know you are vital partners to our work to bring economic opportunity to every uh, community of our nation. Uh, at the Department of Labor, we're committed to investing in Indian country and addressing longstanding barriers to economic inclusion. Um, equity for Indigenous Americans is fundamental value that we hold. Uh, we also recognize that the needs vary from tribe to tribe and region, and the chairman talked about that. So we're committed to engaging and understanding, certainly uh, here at the Department of Labor. Uh, for, for new or growing businesses, we can provide technical assistance and tools that help you invest in your workforce. We can help strengthen workforce through job training and career support. And you know, last this week, when when the president signed the Infrastructure Investment Act and Jobs Act, uh, it's going to create millions of jobs all across America. Uh, as a member of the president's implementation task force, I'm committed to making sure those are good jobs available on equitable basis, including Native Americans. We're going to be able to promote the benefit of the Indian Preference Program in employment. Uh, when it's performed on or near reservations using federal dollars. And we will be able to connect these new jobs to our workforce programs. Uh, we also have an important focus in this space right now. Uh, this week is National Apprenticeship Week here in the United States of America. It celebrates registered apprenticeships and its importance for rebuilding our economy. Uh, registered apprenticeships uh, provide a talented pipeline for growing businesses and empowers workers to build good careers and earn middle-class wages and jobs. It's a key focus in this year on creating diverse and equitable access to registered apprenticeships and certainly includes Indian country. Uh, well, I just quickly, I want to invite tribal leaders to reach out to the department about creating a registered apprenticeship program in your own community. Uh, and if you want any more information uh, quickly, you can visit apprenticeship.gov slash NAW or just go to dol.gov to learn more. Thank you. Mr. Guzman, you're next. Thank you so much. And it is a pleasure to be here with this panel uh, and at this summit. Uh, I was pleased to be serving in California right prior to this. And of course, Governor Newsom had uh, convened a tribal summit as well. Really informative for me in leading on small businesses and innovative startups, how much we can do uh, to really support economic development on, on tribal lands and with native owned businesses. Uh, you know, especially during COVID, we've recognized that uh, economic development must focus on small business development. And you have an increased interest in doing so, an increase in SBA's programs, an in increase in the relevance locally of investing in our small businesses and our innovative startups uh, mm -hmm. for job creation and, and, and strengthening local economies. Uh, SBA is, is committed and positioned to really support Native-owned businesses. Uh, and uh, under the president's vision of trying to ensure that our ecosystems are built up in an equitable manner, uh, the SBA is trying to design programs uh, at the at the onset uh, with our uh, all of our entrepreneurs in mind, and and that includes having you know frank conversations to understand what uh, some of those challenges and longstanding barriers are, so that we can overcome them overcome them and truly create uh, equity for our native owned businesses. Uh, SBA is really committed to focusing on access to capital, and we're so pleased that within the Build Back Better agenda, there are investments in expanding uh, capital programs, you know, both loans and investments at the SBA so that we can uh, really contribute greatly to especially our emerging entrepreneurs and those underserved entrepreneurs, uh, including Native-owned businesses. Uh, within uh, our entire framework, we're really trying to make sure that uh, we connect properly, build bridges to communities that we saw at the onset of some of the early SBA COVID relief were excluded. Uh, and so we were very pleased to announce recently as part of the President's American Rescue Plan, the Community Navigator Pilot Program. Uh, with that program, we funded 51 organizations across the country to operate in the hub and spoke model. And there are over 400 spokes uh, that will build bridges that are uh, to communities. And one of our uh, tier one level uh, organizations is a native CDFI intermediary that's convening uh, native CDFIs to really focus on capital and technical assistance. And we have five others uh, focused within our tier two level that are really going to concentrate on trying to reach out to tribal communities. Beyond the Community Navigator pilot program, we're going to make sure we integrate it across our programs uh, to build those bridges so that we can, on the other side, focus on market access, 
uh, and connecting to networks as there are key investments as well within Build Back Better uh, to expand contracting and do it equitably, uh, to ensure that we're investing in innovation and in connecting our small businesses uh, to innovation research grants and acceleration opportunities for those science-based and uh, technology-based startups. Uh, so we look forward to partner and we look forward to this further conversation today to make sure that we're aligned and can support uh, tribal communities and economic development growth for small businesses. Thank you, Thank you. Administrator. Senior Advisor Sperling. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I'm really honored to be here. I, I'm, uh, you know, so strongly support, you know, as you said, with everything going on, that nobody ever thought for a moment that this would not, this would not be as important, that this summit uh, would ever not be emphasized. And obviously, you've already had the President of the United States here, so... Uh, um, uh, in, the, in the midst of everything, so, uh, and, and really virtually the entire cabinet and, and senior White House leadership. Let me just make a couple points. I mean, I don't need to tell anybody here that uh, as the coordinator of the American Rescue Plan, that $32 billion is for tribal governments, for, for Indian countries, it is the largest single investment ever. Um, but, you know, for, for President uh, Biden, what he really understands, and I mean, he feels this in his gut, and he, he hits us on this every time. How is it going to work? Are people going to get the money? Is it, you know, how, you know, what are all the issues of implementation? And it's not because he's an implementation nerd, it's because he understands that government is about actually delivering benefits to people, to businesses, to families, to tribal governments, to communities, so that they can uh, improve lives, improve opportunity, improve security. So implementation is just an absolutely critical part of all of this. Now, um, the state and local plan is like, and tribal plan is like nothing we've ever seen in this country. If you look at the CARES Act, it was like 50 states and maybe 120 uh, local governments. There are 30,000 uh, local and state government, tribal governments who are receiving this funds. It's unprecedented. And it is not just tribal governments who may be feeling a little uh, overwhelmed at times. Believe me, the overwhelming amount of those local governments are appreciate the funds that they're getting, but it's a challenge. And we recognize that challenge. And so, uh, you know, when we consult, we don't consult for just that sake. We, we listen and we ask, are the rules we have, however right or uh, well-intentioned they are, are they actually uh, serving the purposes that we want? And so we have heard and listened, and we've made adjustments. Uh, uh, November 5th, uh, we made clear that if your uh, state local grant was, uh, and tribal grant was under $30 million, that you'd be annualized, not quarterly, that you would have a few months more until April 3rd. Um, we made clear that you would have six months more to, before you could be subject to reallocation on the all-important emergency rental assistance that can make such a difference in preventing evictions. We listened about whether it was really necessary for tribal governments to need to prove compliance with certain civil rights laws that would just slow down uh, assistance and not serve the purposes that those laws were intended for. And that, uh, again, decision was just made on November 15th. The other thing that we've done is make sure that the funds are there. Uh, we're not taking a chance, as we saw at the beginning of the PPP program in, 19, in 2020, we're not taking a chance that some people could be left out because they got put at the back of the line or other people were more sophisticated or could hire more consultants to help them apply. If you look at things, whether it's $100 million in broadband in the capital project uh, or, or, or the funds uh, for EDA or for the state small business credit initiative, all of them have funds set aside to ensure those funds will be there for the tribal governments. And I think we just have to keep talking because, you know, as I've learned in this job, the 
you know, it is the last mile that matters the most, and it is the last mile that is the hardest. You can do a lot of planning, you can do a lot of design, but how do you actually get those funds into people's hands? The emergency rental assistance is working much better now because of the realities of just making documentation simpler, relying more on self-attestation, getting more people to do that. The child tax credit, which could make such a huge difference in economic security and child poverty. We understand many people are not signed up. How do we get people signed up? We understand that there are places in the country where getting online and doing uh, is not as easy. So we gotta look and ask, why are people not signing up? Do we need more physical locations? Do we need to fund more navigators, more trusted messengers? This is the nitty gritty, but it's the nitty gritty that changes lives. Because a family with three children that can get $9,600 this year, we know that can make a big difference. So on things like the child tax credit, we expect Build Back Better to pass. We expect to be doing this this year and the next year. And that's something where we wanna work and work and work on the implementation side till we get those funds uh, into the families and homes uh, of those in, in, in Indian country uh, who, who need it most. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sperling. I'm gonna turn very um, quickly to a workforce um, development um, topic. And I'm gonna um, go ahead and use my prerogative as the moderator to collapse this question with some ideas about tribal colleges and where they fit into this whole workforce development arena. So the question really is, uh, what new workforce initiatives should the administration focus on um, in the next year and beyond that, but also how can we better uh, partner with tribal colleges and universities to pr promote workforce development? And so let's uh, go back to Chairman Allen. Well, thank you, Janie. Um, um, I'm, I'm sort of reflecting on, on how you're steering the question. Um, with, without a doubt, the, uh, the local colleges, uh, including the Indian colleges, can be of assistance to the tribes um, in terms of, of developing um, uh, workforce needs. Um, I, uh, we work with uh, one of our local colleges that, that's literally in our, in our neighborhood on development of nursing for our for our healthcare program. Uh, and because we, uh, even though we're a small tribe, we serve over 17,000 people and, um, and nurses are, are critical. So we, we collaborate with them. But I, I would raise this, uh, the issue of, of workforce um, needs and the challenges. Without a doubt, COVID has caused us some problems. Um, I say the reality to you uh, uh, to, on the audience here, probably all of us are struggling with people not wanting to come back to work. Um, even, even as we're beginning to, de to defeat the uh, pandemic um, and we're still working around uh, the, the issues that the pandemic has caused us, um, we're having a tough time everywhere uh, recruiting and bringing people back to work. Um, so that's been a big issue for us. But one of the, I think that one of the challenges are as a topic that was touched on earlier, um, and that is child care. So the average uh, young family can't afford child care, and so they're not going to go to work. And we need that workforce. And so, quite frankly, I'm, I'm hopeful that the early learning program uh, the administration is is advancing um, is going to be helpful in in getting those kinds of programs up and running. The colleges can be helpful on, on, on that agenda, uh, but they're not the only solution. Uh, we all have needs for, for affordable uh, childcare programs to get those young families back to the work, into the workforce so that uh, the, the high cost of childcare um, and making sure that the childcare is running professionally um, and, and to the benefit of those children they're taking care of will work to help us out with the, with the, with the uh, workforce uh, recruitment needs. Um, and and I, I believe that childcare is going to eventually have to become a part of the benefit of packages that we can provide um, to recruit and retain our, our workforce. The second issue I wanted to touch on, because there, there are many, but uh, housing for our workforce is a, is a big deal. If you live in an area like my area, which I think a lot of my colleague uh, uh, communities uh, uh, share, uh, when we recruit professionals, at, whether they're vocational or, or white collar professionals at different levels, 
when they look into the, our, the, the area, they can't find homes. They can't find homes to rent, much less to buy, that are affordable, quite frankly. So that is a huge problem. So I know that the administration is a, and the American Rescue Money is, a, is intended to help tackle that, that problem. The infrastructure is a part of that solution as well. But I can tell you whether I'm recruiting for, for schools or recruiting for healthcare programs or recruiting for any, any of our businesses, uh, the biggest challenge is where do you locate them? And if you live in a rural community, like many of us do, um, it's very hard to, uh, to provide that kind of accommodation to recruit them. Um, I would encourage one more thing relative to it. Maybe you establish, uh, uh, this is a HUD issue, but uh, maybe there's, there is a, an incentive. Uh, for those who were trying to buy uh, uh, an affordable health care because they can't even get in the game of, of negotiating a, uh, a loan uh, to get in an affordable health a house if it's available. So let me stop there um, and turn it over to my uh, back to you, uh, Jamie, and um, we'll continue. Thank you much, so much, Chairman. Chairman McCarl. Okay. What are your workforce development. Um, workforce development success in Indian country depends on the ability of tribal nations, native organizations, and tribal colleges and universities, TCUs, to craft innovative, customized solutions designed for, for, the, for the particular capacity building needs of their tribal communities. So to that end, the appropriate role of the federal government is to support programmatic flexibility, training and technical assistance, and the resources that Indian country needs to design and implement bold strategies to advance each community's workforce development priorities. So um, the federal government must endow its systems, programs, and funding protocols with the ease and adaptability that tribal nations need to effectively build their human capacity in accordance with their cultural values and in furtherance of their community and economic goals. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Secretary Walsh. Yeah, uh, you know, coming through a pandemic, we've never seen uh, uh, what um, the world of work has changed. We've never seen how much it's changed. And certainly we're, we're talking about it and working on it every day here in the DOL. Uh, we have an obligation, a historic opportunity to invest in working people. Uh, that's why we're working with Congress, quite honestly, to pass the president's Build Back Better agenda. It's another transformational investment uh, with strong, uh, equ strong equity focus. Uh, th that means investing in training programs that are going to prepare millions of Americans for, for workers in high quality jobs and, and growing sectors like technology, healthcare, and advanced manufacturing. It means uh, creating clean energy jobs to tackle the climate crisis and advance economic environmental justice. And, and now it's, it's also time to have bold transformative change in workforce development uh, and really think about pre kindergarten to mid career training all the way through and the, the build back better. Uh, package includes uh, high quality child care where families can afford it. Uh, it also includes universal pre-kindergarten and also includes investments in, in community colleges and, 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 and that opportunity kind of to your question to, to reframe in the beginning. Uh, these jobs that we have to train for, uh, we're going to need to be able to, to leverage and, and work with on a daily basis our community colleges that, that have the, the students and people's ability to get into those schools, uh, access those programs to, to really think about um, you know, educating and transforming and preparing the workers uh, for the new, new, and new jobs, and quite honestly, in educating younger people, um, we have to have remote. Uh, we have to remove the structural barriers to opportunity, so that Native Americans have a fair shot and real pathways to success and security. Um, the bill right now would invest billions of new dollars in workforce development grant programs, which will be administered by my office, the Department of Labor. Uh, I will tell you this: I will commit to you right now. When this bill passes, we will seek input from and, and through con, uh, tribal consultation from tribal leaders in communities you serve, how to best implement these, implement these new programs. And that, that is a, a bigger tribes, smaller tribes, we will do it. Uh, I'm also grateful to receive advice and recommendations from the Native American Employment Training Council, and we're gonna be seeking their input as well. So uh, we, we're, we're all in uh, when it comes to the Department of Labor because a lot of what we do and what's been discussed uh, here on this panel, but also on the last panel that I listened to is really creating pathways and opportunities and, and we're committed to that at the Department of Labor. Thank you, Secretary. Administrator Guzman. Uh, 
Well, small businesses have definitely been uh, impacted by workforce challenges broadly and uh, experiencing those same types of things that you referenced, uh, Chairman Allen, in terms of competing for workforce. Uh, the SBA, through its resource partner networks, uh, which we have over a thousand centers around the country, uh, you know, working with small businesses to figure out how to navigate these workforce programs uh, and uh, develop strategies, uh, you know, that that are that are useful for them to compete in the marketplace for workforce. Uh, and so we'll continue to try to partner, uh, you know, with the Department of Labor as well as uh, with you all, just to make sure that we're supporting small businesses. Uh, you know, our small business development centers are often the ones located at universities, and we've been pushing across our women's business centers and our small business development centers uh, to locate at uh, minority-serving institutions broadly. And they've expanded uh, within our WBC program to HBCUs, our SBDC programs um, are working uh, collaboratively at uh, at least four TCUs, and we need to grow that, and we need to focus on trying to expand the support network. Um, interestingly, a lot of our programs through the SBDC and WBCs lately have been focused on childcare businesses in particular, uh, and trying to develop more childcare small businesses to uh, support workforce issues. And so we'll continue to lean in on that area to try to help more businesses access workforce. But uh, you know, from my perspective, when we talk about workforce, I also just think about those solopreneurs. You know, 80% of the 32 and a half million small businesses are, are solopreneurs. They've created their own job. And so just in terms of workforce and how I view um, workforce, I do consider all those uh, new startups who have you know, oftentimes left a job because they didn't have childcare um, or they had other challenges and they're trying to uh, do a business. And so we want to make sure that we're working with all of those individuals as well uh, so that they can grow and cultivate their entrepreneurial spirit and have an opportunity uh, to thrive with that, uh, with access to capital and, and growth opportunities with the SBA. Thank you, Thank Administrator. You. Mr. Sperling. Um, let me just make a couple points, respond to both of both the chairman. Um, you know, when I said, you know, 32 billion as, uh, from the American Rescue Plan is the greatest single one-time investment in uh, uh, Indian country and tribal governments, 20 billion of that 32 billion is the, the, the allocation to the tribal governments. That is close to the most flexible funds that you can have. Now, you know, there's some restrictions in there, but when you're talking about helping people get back, get the, the workforce development they need, or any type of the outreach, the transportation, anything that gets people back in job, that is about as square down the middle as you can get. And so, you know, I think that, you know, like Secretary Walsh, I, I believe, the, you know, and Administrator Guzman, I believe the Build Back Better plan will pass, but, there's a lot of ways that you can use that state and local funds as your bridge. You can have f full flexibility in designing those labor market job programs, workforce development, apprenticeship programs, and I would encourage more people to look at those funds uh, and then to think how you can, th those things can also be a booster, to use a common word right now, to getting you started with the additional funds that can come through the uh, Build Back Better plan. So I, I really you know, uh, agree with the flexibility and really want to stress how much that uh, state, local, tribal grant program, the 20 billion, really is flexible and can be designed. And secondly, on childcare. Um, you know, obviously childcare, you know, we, we get two wins from that. When you get childcare, uh, you could create jobs and you can allow more work parents the opportunity to choose career and jobs. So it's a double win. Now, you know, I'm calling governments across the country and asking, what are the issues here? Because we want to be ready when Build Back Better plan. Now, I'll be honest, what you hear a lot is we're afraid to invest a lot in full-time workers. We're afraid to uh, really increase our pay scale, to do all the career mobility things, because we're worried the money's only there for two or three years. If the Build Back Better plan would pass, and we knew that support was coming in for childcare, and we knew it was coming in for pre-K, it's not just that you would have more assurances of the support for childcare and pre-K. I think then you could start to get more opportunity to commit 
to those high quality jobs. That, and this is what you know, the, the president has talked about. I like to call them double dignity jobs because you're giving dignity to other people by giving them the care they need to work, but it's gotta be dignified work with career paths and ability to move up, have decent pay, healthcare. And I'll be honest, when I'm talking, it's a lot that cliff, that fear that the money might only be there for two or three years. So I think once you get the Build Back Better plan, our ability to get childcare going, not only to give childcare for parents to go to work, but start using that as a high quality, high contribution job is gonna go up. And that's really why we need this Build Back Better plan to pass. Thank you, Mr. Sperling. We're gonna switch now to um, an, a tribal leader question from uh, someone in our audience. Uh, and we're gonna shift to Gaila Hosef from Dillingham, Alaska, Tribal Chief of the Curry Young Village. Um, thank you. Um, my name is Gaila Hosef and I am um, a Tribal Chief for Chilgan Tribal Council here located in Dillingham, Alaska. And I'm also heavily involved with um, EPA, National Tribal Operations Committee. So a lot of the stuff that is in that infrastructure bill, we're really excited about what is coming forward. Um, kind of, I guess, going with the questions, I, I had some comments, you know, it's really important to protect our economic resources that are already in place as well. Um, living here in Bristol Bay with our commercial fisheries and our um, wild sustainable salmon, it's really important for us to protect that. And I guess it goes, leads into my question, as um, we get into this process of infrastructure and building infrastructure, it's really important to listen to the people on the land. And um, here in Alaska, we have 229 tribes. And just to remind everybody that, you know, of the 574 tribes is we are the survivors of the survivors. We are the caretakers of our lands. And um, with, with this bill coming out, the major thing that we have um, seen is that broadband is a real is a real problem here in rural Alaska. And if you're looking at economic and work um, workforce development, um, there are really no jobs in rural Alaska that um, that we have up here. And so with broadband connections, it will be able to have people connect virtually like this and also work from home. So I mean that's something to also consider. Um, for jobs, we also need to have um, basic needs. We need to people need to know how to do home maintenance, boilers, um, how to maintain construction. We, we need to start training our youth of, of, of these jobs. These are jobs that are going to sustain our people. Um, when you look at the economic, um, the economics here in Alaska and in rural communities throughout the nation, is our subsistence way of life. Life is a form of economics. Um, we hunt and fish on the lands that you see behind me. Um, so when we have our freezers are full and we have food in our freezer of our, of our lands and the animals that we respect and that return to us each year, um, that's, that's also an economy that is really important to us. So as it goes forward, I guess my question is, is you know, government to government tribal consultation is so important with all this infrastructure that is coming our way um, one of the things that I hear over and over is that we don't have enough time for consultation periods, for public comment periods. And so as these start rolling out to us, because it seems like we're drinking from a water fountain right now with all of the things that are coming our way, um, how, how, um, how are we going to actively engage to where we're going to have um, maybe extended public comment periods during, during this time? Secretary Walsh, I'm going to turn to you for a quick response to that question because I, oh. I think I heard some uh, construction issues in there, and I'm sure there's some of the other concerns that left out at you, and then we're going to close down. No, first of all, thank you for the question, and I think that uh, one thing that the president was very clear on yesterday when he made the announcement, um, uh, when he made the sign, sign the, the, the infrastructure bill into law, uh, he also made an announcement that he brought on uh, former mayor, uh, which I served with when I was mayor of Boston, Mitch Landrieu, former lieutenant governor of Louisiana, to really make sure that these dollars uh, are, are invested properly and that they're done quickly in some cases. I think that uh, you talked about a couple of things. One is that the broadband access, uh, th that's something that has to happen now. I mean, I mean, we've seen it in this country for a long time for, for the future, innovation for the future. 
we need to make sure we get the broadband money out the door. We need to make sure we get the fiber optic cables out there. We need to make sure we're connecting people. Um, to, to I was in New Mexico. I, I was I was on, on, I was it was I was in a reservation in New Mexico. We talked about broadband there. We talked about the importance of investing. Um, that that's going to be what what Department of Commerce is going to be doing, and that's what uh, Mitch Landry is going to be doing. When it comes to job training, that that falls under our shop. I don't think we have to wait. We don't have to wait for this money to be implemented. We don't have to wait for this money to be out there. Uh, I think it's really important for, for anyone anyone on the call today to make sure you reach out to the Department of Labor. Make sure you reach out to us because we we want to partner. I want to partner with everybody that we can to think about what, what are the, the job training opportunities and how can we accustom those job training opportunities to the needs of a community and, and, and to the needs of, of a tribal community. And, and how do we do that? So, you know, I, I feel good where we're going. Uh, Gene Sperling, who's on this call today, who's on who's in the meeting with us, Gene Gene was one of his responsibilities to make sure that the American Rescue Plan was implemented, and, and working really closely with communities. There's no process where we have to sit down and have a lot of testimony. We already know where the shortfalls are, so now what we need to do is make sure the money gets implemented as quickly as possible. These are investments we need to get out there. Thank you, thank you, Secretary Walsh. And with that, we're going to close down this panel. Janie. Yes, Jane. Chairman, Chairman McCarthy. Yeah, I have one, one last quick comment because that second question was skipped over. But um, you know, we've there's been a number of developing legal issues here on uh, so far in this administration, and uh, I think Treasury resolved one just recently uh, regarding the applicability of civil rights. But the underpinning of economic development for tribes takes place. Uh, on a foundation of tribal sovereignty. And we've had many fruitful discussions with various agencies on these issues. So while we appreciate the diligence of these efforts so far, I need to recommend and strongly urge the appointment of a tribal legal advisor in the Attorney General's Office at the Department of Justice. This appointment and leadership would streamline the learning curve for many who are unfamiliar with the legal foundations of tribal sovereignty. So we can do the work necessary in all these arenas and move things efficiently forward. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Macaro. Thank you, Chairman Allen. It's very nice to see both of you all today. Thank you, Secretary Walsh. Thank you, Administrator Guzman. And thank you, Senior Advisor Sperling, for all joining us today. Thank you.